All right, now we're going to talk about statistical power, which we discussed in class, but this is going to go through that material and then a few more examples. Now, I won't expect you to calculate power on any exam, but I will expect you to understand what it is and understand how these diagrams are working. So I might ask you questions to identify what's going on in certain diagrams, uh, fairly specifically identify um, the areas involved, like, you know, this area, what is it, etc. So let's get started here. Uh, understand power, you have to flash back to when we talked about the different decisions that can be made during hypothesis testing. Some of them are correct decisions and some of them are errors. So we've got this situation where we have a two by two table. We have four possibilities. Either the reality of the hypothesis, could, the, the null hypothesis could be that the null is true or it's false. Or our decision could also independently be whether we retain it or reject it based on the data that we have in front of us. So that leads to four relatively independent types of errors, not totally independent. Anyway, if the null hypothesis is true and yet we reject it, that's a type one error that's very bad. The probability of that is alpha. And what we're really interested in in this lecture is the next one over here. The correct decision of rejecting a, a null hypothesis um, when the null hypothesis is false. So rejecting a false null hypothesis. That's a good decision. We should do that. And it's called statistical power. The probability of that happening is called statistical power. Sometimes that's called one minus beta because beta is the probability of a type two error. And so one minus beta is power. Sometimes people use the lowercase pi because I think pi is like P and it stands for power. I'll try and do that since it's a little easier to remember than one minus beta. Uh, but anyway, this is statistical power, and we're very interested in calculating this because we often need to know, um, should we reject the null hypothesis? How likely is it that we would reject the null hypothesis under certain, certain circumstances? If we didn't find a, statist a, a statistically significant effect, in other words, if we did not reject the null hypothesis, should we have? Well, if you only had a sample size of five, then you shouldn't be surprised that you didn't reject the null hypothesis. It's probably not because your, your alternative hypothesis is false. At least you don't know. You're never going to get to that point because your study had so little power. It was really ridiculous. Or if you're looking for, if your alternative hypothesis suggests that there's a tiny, tiny difference um, between what you believe is going on and what the null hypothesis says is going on, well, you have very little power to reject the null hypothesis. So when we apply for funding, when we want money from the government or from the university or whatever to do any research, we almost always have to conduct a power analysis and figure out what our statistical power is. So another way to describe the statistical power is any of these uh, statements here. It's the probability of finding a true effect. An effect means a difference between your hypothesized alternative hypothesis expected value and then the null hypothesis effect, expected value. So the probability of finding a true effect or the difference sometimes stated as the difference between your sample mean and then the null hypothesis expected value. The probability of rejecting a false null hypothesis. These are conditional probabilities. That false makes it conditional. The probability of retaining a true alternative hypothesis. These are all power. So this is how we set up power. You've got the null hypothesis situation, and this only makes sense with a null hypothesis test. The null hypothesis situation, you specify the sampling distribution of the means according to the null hypothesis right here. And there you go. Null hypothesis, you specify your critical value, which is based on alpha. You say, if I want a, an alpha of 0.05, I want a 5% chance of rejecting a true uh, null hypothesis, you know, if the null hypothesis is true, I, then my critical value has to be right there. Well, to calculate power, you have to specify an alternative hypothesis as well. Just saying um, the alternative hypothesis is that mu is greater than zero won't work because we can't calculate probabilities with that. We need a specific distribution. So to calculate power, we actually have to make a decision, and this is, can be really fussy and you can have all sorts of reasons why you might decide on a particular value. You have to specify a mean according to the alternative hypothesis. Now that sampling distribution will be identical to the null hypothesis sampling distribution. In fact, identical to the confidence interval sampling distribution, right? It's the same process. You have the same standard deviation, you have the same shape, it's, it's normal or as normal as it would have been with the confidence or the central limit theorem 
It's the same size and shape as this other distribution. It's just slid over in some direction. It's centered over a different value. For confidence intervals, this, this sampling distribution was centered over the sample mean. For null hypothesis testing, it's centered over the null hypothesis expected uh, value. And for the alternative hypothesis, it's centered over the alternative hypothesis expected value. Those are the only differences between these sampling distributions because otherwise they're the same. They're the same shape, the same size, the same variability. They're made out of the same things. They're made out of sampling of means, a sampling distribution of means. So taking the critical value from the null hypothesis test, because that's the decision you are going to make. You're going to make a decision based on that value. If something is to the right of that value in this particular case, then you will reject the null hypothesis. And if it's to the left, you will not reject it. So looking at that critical value, looking at the rejection region that you've set up with your null hypothesis test, any value that falls in that rejection region, any sample mean that could fall in that rejection region will result in you rejecting the mean, right? Or rejecting the null hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis is true, then the probability of that happening is alpha. But if the alternative hypothesis is true, the probability of that happening is 1 minus beta, or pi. In other words, the blue part here. So that's a lot of power in this situation. There's like 90, 95% power in this situation. But what if we move the alternative hypothesis mean much closer to the null hypothesis mean? Now we're down to, I don't know, like 60% power or something like that. So these, these are things that affect the power of your situation, of, of your research hypothesis test. This hypothesis test has less power to reject the null hypothesis. And this is even if the alternative hypothesis is true, because if the alternative hypothesis is true, then the blue line describes reality. But you're still going to make your decision based on that cutoff value from the null hypothesis, because you don't know what's true and what's not. You just know how you're going to make your decision. And so if the alternative hypothesis has a mean specified exactly where mu a is in this diagram, then your power is much lower. But if your mu a is much further from the null hypothesis, you might have much higher power. If you make a more stringent alpha level, then you have less power because it's harder to reject the null hypothesis. If you have a more lenient alpha level, although my colors aren't working very well, then you have more power because it is easier and more likely that you're going to reject the null hypothesis in this situation. So these are the things that will that will change your power situation here. Um, power only makes sense if you're doing a null hypothesis test. It's directly related to your test decisions. Everything is determined by that cutoff value, that critical value that you determine uh, that you choose because of your alpha level, because of your null hypothesis expected mean. And whether you have a directional or non-directional test matters, and sample size very much matters. Bigger sample size, more power. Directional, more power. Alpha, if you have a more lenient alpha, like 0 0.10, more power. And if mu0 and mu a are strongly separated, are really far from each other, more power. So let's go back through an example that we had before and walk through how power works here. We've got this situation with the manufacturer of the flashlights, etc. The same sample mean um, and the same population mean, the same sample size. Oh, wait, we have no sample mean. The same population mean is what I meant to say. And the same population standard deviation, the same sample size, same alpha. This implies a one-tailed test again, because we're looking to see whether flashlight longevity has reduced, not whether it has changed. Now, if you're really spunky, you can go figure out what the power is here. If not, follow along. Um, so what if we specify a particular value that we say, well, what if this is the true new longevity? So maybe the true longevity of flashlights now on average is 640 hours. So we now have a sample point estimate that we don't care about. Sampling distribution of the estimate, standard error, mean of the sampling distribution implied by the null hypothesis, and implied by the alternative hypothesis. Those are the critical things. Actually, I don't know why I left sample point estimate on here. It doesn't matter. Not for power tests. Power tests are about what might happen, not about what did happen. We've got these two sampling distribution means, and your null hypothesis test is set up. So this null and alternative hypothesis 
are both very critical. And they're exactly the same as before. Doing a power analysis doesn't change your null and alternative hypothesis because those are actually all about the null anyway. They're all about the null implied value. The alternative implied value isn't even in here. It's just null hypothesis is that the true mean is this, and the alternative hypothesis is that it's less than this. That's all. The true alternative, uh, the alternative hypothesis value that you've specified, the, the mean, according to the alternative hypothesis, isn't even in this situation. So, yeah, your setup is exactly the same as it was before, but that implies your cutoff. So here's your setup. You've got sampling distribution of the means. It's a normal distribution. And you've got your mean of your null hypothesis. You've got your area of 0.05 cutoff in one tail. Now let's shift that over because we've got to make room for this other distribution because we said to the left of that is going to be alternative hypothesis. And so we find the critical value. Oh, we already did this. Yeah, I think I put those animations in the wrong order. So we've got your critical value, negative 1.65. Now we need to specify the sampling distribution of the means according to the alternative hypothesis. There, now we're doing it right. We move this over, and there we go. So this is our situation now. Alternative hypothesis sampling distribution is right next to the null hypothesis sampling distribution. Now I cheated, I know exactly what the overlap is because I used computers, but when you're drawing this by hand, you won't know exactly how much overlap there is, so just kind of take your best shot. Um, but it's kind of hard to know sometimes. Sometimes you have to erase your entire curve and redraw it once you figure out how close or far away those things are. Computers are better for this. So you've got your z-critical in the null hypothesis distribution. Notice that I made it red. This is a z. This z doesn't work over here. If this was a z-score over here, it would have to be positive, right? Because it would be above this mean. It's below this mean. That's why it's negative. It's 1.65 standard deviations below this mean. And that's our cutoff value. So our power is going to be the area under this curve here that's in the rejection region from this curve. So we need to find that blue area, and that's the tricky part. It's not that complicated if you think through it, and if you've got a good grasp of how to use the normal approximation, I think you can work it out, but it does take a few steps. Let's walk through it. You need to find the area in the blue distribution, which means you're going to have to find the z-score in the blue distribution to look up that area, and then you're going to need to find the raw score to look up the z, to calculate the z-score. So you gotta work your way, way backwards and there's a few steps. So we're gonna find the raw score that goes with the z-critical value according to the null hypothesis. We're gonna use that raw score to find the z-critical as it exists in the alternative hypothesis. And then we're gonna use that z-score to look up the area in the alternative hypothesis that corresponds to power. So first we need to find the raw score for the z critical value that's in the null hypothesis. And we just use a formula for that. We know that the z, that the z score for that is negative 1.65 in the, in the null hypothesis. And so the raw score, we can always figure that out with this formula here. Uh, but everything we're doing here is in the sampling distribution of means. So we've got means now. And instead of sigma here, we have the standard error of the mean, which we calculated a few slides back. And in, the mean here is the null hypothesis sampling mean because this z-score came from a distribution with this mean. So to figure out what the raw score of that z-score is, we have to go back to this mean where, where this z-score was specified in. So there we go. We worked that out and it works out to be 645.7. That's the critical value expressed as a mean or raw score, raw score unit. So now we've got this diagram, and now we've got here what the raw score is of that critical value. Its z-score over here is negative 1.65. Its raw score, which is the same for any distribution, is 645.7. Now we need to figure out its z-score over here so we can calculate area. So that's the next step here. That's emo teen. Uh, this is mislabeled. Anyway, uh, I believe it has the right values. Anyway, ignore the touch emo teens, that's a later example. So we figure out, if you run through the regular z-score formula, you figure out that the z-score for this is a positive 1.5. So this is where we end up. The raw score for this critical value that has a negative 1.65 z-score over here is 8.31. And that has a z-score over here 
in the alternative hypothesis distribution of 1.25. And now we have a standard normal hypothesis or normal curve approximation setup. We've got a z-score, a mean, and a standard deviation, which is the standard error. So we can figure out the area below that. So in this case, we want to know the area below. So looking up the alternative hypothesis distribution area that's in the rejection region of the um, null hypothesis distribution. And so for our z-score of 1.25, we find that the area is 0.89. That's pretty good. So area, the power is 0.89. And my little R script up here generated 0.893. Oops. So this is where we ended up. We started out with this distribution. We specified what we would do in the null hypothesis test. We would reject the null hypothesis if we found any sample mean that was lower than a z-score of 1.65 here. So it turns out we would reject the null hypothesis here if we found any sample mean that was smaller than 8.31. Well, if the alternative hypothesis mean was here, what that means is that that critical rejection region of rejection value of 8.31 was a z-score of 1.25 over here. And we look at the area below that, and it was 0.89, so that's our power. So that's pretty good. If the new manufacturing process has actually produced a mean of 640 hours of flashlight longevity, so that's the alternative hypothesis implied mean, then this study has an 89% chance of rejecting the null and concluding that longevity has gone down. So the interpretation of power, unfortunately, like everything else here, is a conditional probability. Look at this if. There we go. So now we're finally to the Dutch emo teens. So back to our Dutch emo teens situation. Same as before, you've got this mean here. You've got the standard deviation here. You've got a sample size of 87, an alpha of 0.05. But now we're asking a power question. We're not going to do a hypothesis test. We'll set up the hypothesis test, and then we'll ask the power of that hypothesis test. So what if the Dutch emo teen mean is 9.0? So we're going to do, we've set up a two-tailed situation, a two-tailed research situation. So what if the mean is 9.0? So the sampling distribution of means is all possible sample means from n equals 87. And that distribution will have the same standard error, whether it's the null hypothesis implied distribution or the alternative hypothesis implied distribution. It will be the same size and shape. It'll be normal. It'll have a standard error of 1.169 or standard deviation of 1.169. It'll be a sampling distribution of means. It's just that it might be over the null hypothesis value, 10.6, or it might be centered over the alternative hypothesis value, 9.0. So the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis are the same as they were before, if you remember that example from the previous lecture. The null hypothesis is that the true emo mean is here. The alternative hypothesis is, is that it's here. Even though this is alternative hypothesis, once again, that specified value that we have is not here. 9.0, it's not here. It's not written out here. It's implied here, though, because 9.0 is not 10.6, right? It's different from 10.6. So it's so we took the entire range of all the possible things that aren't 10.6, and we chose one of them, and we said 9.0. That's what we're going to go on. Sometimes we do power tests for a variety of different uh, situations. So this is our two-tailed hypothesis test setup, and we find the critical value for the null hypothesis test, which is super, super easy because we've done this a lot of times at this point, or you should have done this. It's 1.96 because we want 0.025 in each tail. So our Z critical for the hypothesis test is going to be plus or minus 1.96. And then we specify the sampling distribution of the means for the alternative hypothesis. Now specify the distribution means uh, you need to know everything that's important to know about the distribution. So far, with a no normal distribution, you need to know the mean and the standard deviation. And you need to know that it's normal. And that's it. So specify the distribution means. What's its mean? What's its standard deviation? And make sure you know that it's normal and draw a diagram. So here's our diagram. Here's how everything is set up. Now, there's a plus 1.96 up here. And technically, we should include this teeny, teeny tail here that goes out to the right in our power. But calculating by hand, do that. That's much effort to figure out. I mean, you can do it. It's not that hard, but it kind of adds a bunch of work. So we're not going to do that. And it's only going to add a tiny, tiny bit of power, far less than 1%. So I'm not going to worry about it. Power is an estimate anyway. I'm just going to ignore that when we're calculating by hand. A computer will take into account, and that's fine. So this is the critical region that we're really concerned about, is this negative 1.96 here. So here comes the tricky part. We need to find the raw score for the Z critical 
in the null hypothesis distribution. And so our negative 1.96 is the value that we're concerned with, remembering that we're dealing with the sampling distribution of means and the standard deviation in this formula needs to be the standard error because the distribution that this comes from is a distribution of means and the standard deviation of this distribution is the standard error. So we're going to plug 1.7 in, 1.17 in right here for sigma. And then the null hypothesis implied mean is 10.6. So that goes there. All right, so if we multiply this out, then we find that the critical value here is 8.31. So that Z critical of negative 1.96 corresponds to a raw score of 8.31. So we can put that on our graph here. And that's the value below which we would reject the null hypothesis if we found any sample mean. If we found any sample mean with a value lower than 8.31, that would mean we rejected the null hypothesis. But we find that area we have to use that value to find the z-critical, that z-value in the, al in the um, alternative hypothesis implied distribution. So we work things out here. Now that Jim Martins is accurate at the top of this slide. So we use our z-score formula, and we figure out that the raw score equivalent that goes along with um, a mean or with a z-score of 8.31. Thank you. I'll be with you in a few minutes. Too cute for her and good. So we put that on here. We have a z-score of negative 0.59. And now it's just a matter of looking in the table and finding out what the area below negative 0.59 is. Ta-da! So 0 0.59, 0 0.2776. That's our power estimate. It's not a lot. The computer came up with the same answer. That's really comforting. That's not an actual lot of power. It's pretty pathetic, actually. So in conclusion, if the true BDI mean for the Dutch teens is 9, then this study has a pathetic amount of power. It only has a 28% chance of correctly concluding that the Dutch emo teen mean is lower than the general population's BDI2 mean. It only has a 28% chance of avoiding a type 2 error. So if the alternative hypothesis is true, and if its mean is 9.0, then this particular study only has a 28% chance of not making a type 2 error. So this is really low power. This is pathetic. We'd like to have power around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, maybe above. So final activity, the Roman gravestones. I switched up some values in here, so pay attention because they aren't the same as before. So the standard Roman pattern of funerary inscription is found on an average, and this is the null hypothesis mean, of 72% of tombstones per cemetery, 
with a standard deviation of 32.3. I changed all these numbers. I even changed the hypothesis direction. In all the regions, all over the place, so this is a population value of the outskirts of the Republic during the late imperial period, according to prior research. So this is me setting up the, um, sorry, the null hypothesis and the expected value according to the null hypothesis. So now, study, so Marcia, archaeologists suspect, this is the alternative hypothesis, that Roman influence was actually growing. So I reverse this from the other example, growing in a particular region of Turkey at that time. They count the tombstones in late imperial period cemeteries in 36 villages randomly sampled from this region, from the hundreds of villages in this region, to test their hypothesis, alpha equals 0.01. So we've implied a positive hypothesis test because Roman influence was growing, and so that would imply that there should be more than 72% average um, Roman pattern inscriptions. So what if the true mean percentage in this region of Turkey from this late imperial period in cemeteries is 85% on average, <coughs> a mean of 85% of tombstones per cemetery that have the Roman pattern inscription in it? And what is the probability that the archaeologists will reject the null? So this is a confusing situation. I probably should have made something less confusing, but you know, that's stats for you. Um, the null hypothesis taken from previous research all over the Roman Republic at this time says that there should be 72% on average, a mean of 72% per cemetery of Roman inscriptions with a standard deviation of 32.3%. The alternative hypothesis says it should be more than that. And so we can take one of those more than that values and say 85%. What if it's truly 85% in this part of Turkey? More than in the rest of the outskirts of the Roman Republic. Like in this part of Turkey, things are actually, Rome, Rome's influence was actually growing, not, not declining during the late imperial period. So sampling distribution of the estimate, the sampling distribution of the mean, in other words, for both distributions, is all possible sample means from n equals 36. The mean of that according to the null hypothesis is 72%. Now you can just treat these percents as if they were just numbers. There, there's some situations where you can't treat proportions and percents like this, but in this case you can. The mean of the sampling distribution implied by the alternative hypothesis, we chose a specific value of 85%. I don't know why we did this. In reality, you'd choose that based on your amazing knowledge of the research uh, and your field of study. And the standard error for both of those is going to be 32.3, the standard deviation and the population, divided by the square root of the sample size. So it's going to be 5.38%. So here's the null in the alternative hypothesis. Same setup as before, but the values have changed. So the, the mean according to the null hypothesis that these villages in Turkey came from is a population with an average of 72%, the same as the rest of the Republic, of Roman inscriptions. Oh, I messed this up. And then that should be the hypothesis test according to this situation, um, the hypotheses are set up similarly to how they were before, but now some values have changed. So 72% is the null hypothesis implied value, and that's all that's in the hypothesis test. Remember, our alternative hypothesis implied value doesn't appear here anywhere at all. It just doesn't even exist here. So according to the null hypothesis, 72% should be the average uh, Roman inscription percent per cemetery in this region of Turkey, but according to alternative hypothesis, this region of Turkey should have an average greater than 72%. And we've chosen a value of 85% to um, test the power of this. It's like, what if it's really 85%? So we find the critical value for the null hypothesis test. Easy peasy, you know how to do this. There you go. One-tailed alpha equals 0.01. There you go, we have 2.33. That gives us 99% in the lower end or 1% in the, in the upper end. So we specify the sampling distribution of the means for the alternative hypothesis now. And we said it's 85%. So this blue line here is 85%. Now the right to the left of it is going to be the cutoff level. The computer showed us that those are actually very close to each other. So the cutoff level for alpha, but right here is the alternative hypothesis mean 85%. And Z, 
the null hypothesis is 2.33, the z critical. I put z0, uh, I don't know the terminology here. Um, but then we find the area in the alternative hypothesis sampling distribution of means, which we've done before, so let's walk through that, if, which means we need to find what the raw score for that critical value is. So the critical value is 2.33. We remember everything is in the sampling distribution of means, so that sigma is actually a standard error if we want to figure out what that raw score value is here. So we plug in standard error of 5.38, 2.33 is the z-score, it's positive, and 72 is the mean according to the null hypothesis, which is where this z-score came from. So we'd find an x, uh, a mean critical of 84.5, very close to 85, it's only half a point away, which is a little coincidental, but it means that our power is going to be close to 0.5, because our critical value just coincidentally happened to be pretty close to the mean according to the alternative hypothesis that we specified. So now we've use that to find z-critical in the alternative hypothesis. So we calculate a critical a z-value with negative 0 0.09. And then we use that to find an area. So in this case, we want the area above a z of negative 0 0.09. And it turns out below it is 0.46. So above it should be 1 minus 0 0.46. There we go, so 0.54. So that's our power. Not great. We don't really like power of 0.5. We like power of 0 0.9, 0 0.95, 0 0.99. Those, those are great power. Then you know you've got a really good chance. You've got a good chance of rejecting the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis um, should be rejected. So our conclusion could be if in reality blah blah blah. We only have a 54% chance. I would I would look at the wording here and look at all the hemming and hawing and dancing around and double negatives or whatever I had to do to make this work because it's a confusing situation. But the takeaway point is 54% chance of avoiding a type 2 error. Not good. You don't like that. And that's the end of that lecture.